This is the northern portion of the beautiful Sea of Galilee. Jesus knew this area very, very well indeed. This lake is only a small lake. In fact, it's only uh, about 12 miles from north to south. But it's a part of the great rift valley that runs all the way up from Africa. It is subject to very sudden climatic changes. The wind can come roaring down from the north, and within a few moments, you can have huge seas. On one occasion, Jesus was out on a boat with his disciples, and he was just sleeping peacefully like a baby in the back of the boat. And there came a tremendous storm. It appeared as though the boat was going to go down. And the disciples came and shook him and they said, Master, don't you care that we're going to perish? And Jesus stood up and he rebuked the winds and the seas. And Jesus said, Peace, be still. And the Bible says, There was a beautiful calm. Jesus, you see, my friend, is the Lord of the universe. He's Lord over the elements. He's Lord over the waves. He's Lord over the winds. He's Lord over the tempests. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And when you're going through a storm, and we all go through storms in our own lives, it's a wonderful thing to know that Jesus can calm the storm. The topic today is taking the lid of the devil's cauldron. I'm going to talk about eternal torment. Would you please come over here to Mark chapter 9 and notice the words of Jesus when he talks about hell. Mark chapter 9. Glad to see so many Bibles in church. Glad to see so many people in church. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. The words of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark chapter 9, verse 43. The Lord said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. We're going to answer the question today, does hell exist? I want to say this up front. You're going to agree with this by the time I'm through. I'm through. No teaching has done more to turn people from God than the teaching of eternal torment. No teaching has done more to blaspheme and slander the name of God than the teaching that God will torture and torment lost sinners relentlessly for all eternity. Today, we're going to take the lid of the devil's cauldron because there he's got a pot and it's bubbling away with the most nefarious teachings. I was reading this week the great uh, Irish author, uh, James Joyce. And uh, I took it out again last night because I knew there was a chapter here on hell. James Joyce, as most of you would know, is, is one of Ireland's uh, favorite sons, a great author. And uh, here he describes what children were taught uh, when they were growing up in Ireland when they went along to church. And the priest is saying these words. This is James Joyce, the Dubliners, a portrait of the artist as a young man. What I'm going to read to you is what millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people have been taught and are still being taught. Now, this is going to shock some of you. In fact, after I read it through, I, uh, I just felt somewhat nauseated, almost overcome. The priest said, 
Yet even then, in that hour of supreme agony, our merciful Redeemer had pity for mankind. Yet even there, on the hill of Calvary, he founded the Holy Catholic Church against which it is promised the gates of hell shall not prevail. He founded it upon the rock of ages and endowed it with his grace with sacraments and sacrifice. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And promised that if men would obey the word of his church, the word of his church, they would still enter into eternal life, but if, after all that had been done for them, they still persisted in their wickedness, there remained for them an eternity of torment, hell. The preacher's voice sank. He paused, joined his palms for an instant, parted them, then he resumed. This is what millions of people have been taught. Listen to it. And then ask yourself the question, is this true? And if it is true, then what is God like? If this is true, what I'm going to read to you, God is the devil. He's a million times worse than bin Laden, the terrorist. Now let us try for a moment to realize as far as we can the nature of that abode of the damned which the justice of an offended God has called into existence for the eternal punishment of sinners. Hell is a straight and dark and foul-smelling prison, an abode of demons and lost souls filled with fire and smoke. The straightness of this prison house is expressly designed by God to punish those who refuse to be bound by his laws. In earthly prisons, the poor captive has at least some liberty of movement. Were it only within the four walls of his cell or in the gloomy yard of his prison, not so in hell. There, by reason of the great number of the damned, the prisoners are heaped together in their awful prison, the walls of which are said to be 4,000 miles thick. And the damned are so utterly bound and helpless that as a blessed saint, Saint Anselm writes in his book on the similitudes, they are not even able to remove from the eye a worm that gnaws it. The horror of this straight, the little boys are sitting here listening. The horror of this straight and dark prison is increased by its awful stench. All the filth of the world, all the awful and scum of the world, we are told shall run there as to a vast reeking sewer when the terrible conflagration of the last day has purged the world. The brimstone too which burns there in such prodigious quantities fills all hell with its intolerable stench. And the bodies of the damned themselves exhale such a pestilential odor that as Saint Bonaventure says, one of them alone would suffice to infect the whole world. The very air of this world, that pure element, becomes foul and unbreathable when it has been long enclosed. Consider then what must be the foulness of the air of hell. Imagine some foul and putrid corpse that has lain rotting and decomposing in the grave, a jelly-like mass of liquid corruption. Imagine such a corpse a prey to flames devoured by the fire of burning brimstone and giving off dense choking fumes of nauseous, loathsome decomposition. And then imagine this sickening stench multiplied a millionfold and a mil millionfold again from the millions upon millions of fetid carcasses massed together in the reeking darkness, a huge and rotting human fungus. Imagine all this and you will have some idea of the horror of the stench of hell. This has been taught and is taught to millions and millions and millions of people. But this stench is not horrible though it is the greatest physical torment to which the damned are subjected. The torment of fire is the greatest torment to which the tyrant has ever subjected to his fellow creature. Place your finger for a moment in the flame of a candle and you will feel the pain of fire. But our earthly fire was created by God for the benefit of man. 
to maintain in him the spark of life and help him in the useful arts, whereas the fire of hell is of another quality and was created by God to torture and punish the unrepentant sinner. Our earthly fire also consumes more or less rapidly according to the object which it attacks, is more or less combustible, so that human ingenuity has even succeeded in inventing chemical preparations to check or frustrate its actions. But the sulfurous brimstone which burns in hell is a substance which is specially designed to burn forever and forever with unspeakable fury. Moreover, our earthly fire destroys at the same time as it burns, so that the more intense it is, the shorter is its duration. But the fire of hell has this property that it preserves that which it burns and though it rages with incredible intensity, it rages forever. And this terrible fire will only, not only afflict the bodies of the damned from without, but each lost soul will be a hell unto itself, the, the boundless fire raging in the very vitals. Oh, how terrible is the lot of those wretched beings. The blood seethes and boils in the veins. The brains are boiling in the skull. The heart and the breast glowing and bursting. The bells, a red hot mass, a burning pulp. The tender eyes flaming like molten balls. You say, nobody believes this? Hundreds of millions. Billions have been taught it. Every sense of the flesh is tortured and every faculty of the soul therewith. The eyes with impenetrable utter darkness. The nose with noisome odors. The ears with yells and howls and execrations. The taste with foul matter. Leprous corruption, nameless suffocating filth. The touch with red hot goads and spikes with cruel tongues of flames. And through the several torments of the senses, the immortal soul is tortured eternally in its very essence amid the leagues upon leagues of glowing fires kindled in the abyss by the offended majesty of the omnipotent God and fanned into everlasting and ever increasing fury by the breath of the anger of the Godhead. Then the priest says, Oh, my dear little brothers in Christ, may it never be our lot to hear that language. And the little boys, the little Irish boys, listen. Listen. There's chapters on this. Last and crowning torture of all the tortures of that awful place is the eternity. The eternity of hell. Eternity, O oh, dread and dire word. Eternity, what mind of man can understand it? And remember, it is an eternity of pain. Even though the pains of hell were not so terrible as they are, they would become infinite as they are destined to last forever. But while they are everlasting, they are at the same time, as you know, intolerably intense, unbearably extensive. To bear even the sting of an insect for all eternity would be a dreadful torment. What must it be then to bear the manifold tortures of hell forever, 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 for all eternity? Not for a year or an age, but for eternity. My father was taught this. The priest rose and turning towards the altar knelt upon the step before the chapel in the fallen gloom. He waited till all in the chapel had knelt and every least noise was still. 
Then raising his head, he repeated the act of contrition phrase by phrase with fervor. The boys answered him phrase by phrase. Stephen, his tongue cleaving to his palate, bowed his head, praying with his heart, Oh my God, oh my God, I am heartily sorry, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, for having offended thee, and I detest my sins, and I detest my sins. That is the doctrine of eternal torment. Who teaches it? Well, the Muslims do. What I'm saying today is not meant to offend you. Our dear friends in the Baptist church do. Dear friend who called me yesterday on the telephone said, I was brought up on this. Our Lutheran friends believe it. And our friends next door, the Mormons, believe it. And the Presbyterians and the Anglicans. And I would suggest to you today, if that is true, what I've read you today, and millions have been taught it, if that is true, I would walk out of this church and I would never come back and I would never pray again. Because I have not been praying to God, I've been praying to the devil. Because there's nobody in the world I know as bad as the person who would do that. And most people hate torture. Time magazine has a picture of a man being tortured on the front page and it says, how far do we go? And the editorial says, it doesn't matter what the person is doing. It doesn't matter whether he's a terrorist or not, whether he's threat threatening the whole of the nation with an atom bomb. Once you cross over the line and you interrogate using torture, you become the sa same as they are. Amen. And that is why civilized countries have always been opposed to torture. Any country that engages in torture is a barbaric, uncivilized state. And we abhor torture. But the God apparently of billions of Christians is a super torturer that makes Adolf Hitler in his dealings with the Jews almost a saint because the fires went out as far as Hitler was concerned. But here is a God, as Joyce tells us, who burns and burns and burns and burns for all eternity, I would not serve and I could not serve such a God. Could you honestly love a God who tortured his children? Now the question is that we're going to consist, uh, deal with today and our talk's going to consist of this basically is what does the Bible teach about hell and what does the Bible teach about God? I personally know today that there are millions of people who've been turned away from God because of what the church has taught and have become cynics and atheists and it is perfectly understandable and some would say justifiable. The text, I want you to come over here again to Mark chapter 9 and verse 43 as we have an in-depth look at the doctrine of of hell and what God is like. Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. Our blessed Lord said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. This text plainly teaches that there will be a place of punishment. And so if you were to ask me today, do you believe in hell? I must say, of course I believe in hell. Because Jesus taught the truth about hell. But it is not the truth that was taught to James Joyce. But the Bible also makes it plain, contrary to what our friends in the Catholic Church and the Baptist Church teaches, no one is in hell today. Would you please come over here to Matthew 13. 
Matthew chapter 13. And I want the television audience, please get your Bible and follow along today. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24 and onwards. Here Jesus gives a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds along with among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The earnest servants came to him and say, said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. It is plain that there is coming a time of separation and a time of burning. Notice verse 37, because here we have the explanation. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at death. No! So it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look at me. The Bible teaches that there is a place of cleansing and a place of judgment. But the Bible teaches it takes place at the end of the world. Therefore, to my beloved brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church who are watching the telecast, I want to tell you a message today from God's Word. There is not a single solitary soul today in purgatory or in hell. Not a single solitary soul. You do not need to be afraid for them. The Bible teaches that hell is a condition that will exist at the end of the world when God cleanses the world. Now, it is most important for everybody to understand this truth. Very few people understand it. Very few preachers understand it. The dead, good and bad alike, are unconscious, awaiting the resurrection. Now, the most commonly taught doctrine in the world today is the immortality of the soul. A million preachers, every Sunday, at every funeral also, talk about the immortality of the soul. I said to a leading television personality this week, an evangelist, why do you believe in this doctrine? And the person said to me, because I was taught it as a child. But the person said to me, I think I have been wrong. Because the Bible does not teach the immortality of the soul. Come over here to 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 and 16. And please turn to the texts. We are not here today just to listen to a preacher. We're here today to discover the teaching of the word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. And here we have a description of the eternal God. Verse 16 says, Who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. The Bible teaches that God alone is immortal. Therefore, listen, if God alone is immortal, and I want to look you in the eye as I talk to you about this, if God alone is immortal, it cannot be said that I have an immortal soul. Now where did this idea come from that inside of us we have an immortal soul? Not from Bible writers. Socrates was one of the greatest of the Greeks, a great Greek philosopher. He committed suicide. 
And before he drank the fatal hemlock, the poison, he said to his disciples, do not be worried about me and do not fear for my salvation because this body is a shell and inside me there is an immortal soul. And the soul goes back to God. This idea of the Greeks permeated the Christian church. We believe it today because we're taught it, not because the Bible teaches it, but because we got it from Socrates and the Greeks. The Bible teaches that the dead are sleeping in their graves. They are unconscious. The Bible says in the book, I have so many texts, you wanted time to turn to them all. But Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4 says, the soul who sins will die. The Bible says, the soul that sins will die. The soul is not immortal, my friend. The soul that sins will die. When I drive in 65 miles to come to this church from my home, and as I drive on the 101 freeway, and look at all the other motor cars. I also glance as I go through Agoura Hills or one of those places at a large billboard that tells me to watch a television program when the speaker will take us beyond and introduce us to our dead loved ones. And millions of people in America are doing this because they are believing the devil's lie. The dead cannot be contacted because the dead are asleep in their graves. I heard perhaps the world's most famous television evangelist say to Larry King on his program some months back, I'm looking forward to my death because I will immediately be with Christ. Death for me, he said, will be my greatest day. He did not get that from the Bible. He got it from Socrates. He does not realize that. But the Bible says, now listen to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says that death is the last enemy. Death is not our friend. It is not the liberator. Come over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to the great chapter on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26, my dear friends. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, Paul says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then when you read on in this chapter, Paul tells us how the last enemy is destroyed. The last enemy is destroyed by the coming of Jesus who raises the dead. As one great British theologian who is not a member of our church has said, you must choose between the resurrection of the dead and the immortality of the soul. The Bible teaches the resurrection of the dead it does not say, as the world's greatest evangelist said, that death is the liberator. Death is the enemy. And death will be destroyed and swallowed up when Jesus comes and the resurrection. Would you come to the words of Jesus in John chapter 5 and verse 28 and 29? John chapter 5. And verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. And come out, those who've done good will rise to live, and those who've done evil will rise to be condemned. My friend, the Bible teaches that the dead are sleeping in the grave. And the Bible says, when Jesus returns, the dead are going to be called out of their graves. Now, you know the story from the book of Genesis. God said to our first parents, don't touch this fruit. Because if you do, 
and the words of Scripture are plain and powerful and persuasive. God said, when you eat this, you will surely die. And the Hebrew says, dying you will die. Nothing more definite. And Lucifer said to our first parents, you will not surely die, but you will be like God, knowing good and evil. At almost every funeral, that sermon is preached again. And the preacher stands up and he says, your dead loved ones are in heaven because the soul cannot die. The idea of the immortality of the soul comes from the devil himself. It is the devil's lie. And when you take the pot off this infernal cauldron, out comes the fumes of hell. God said, you'll die. The devil said, you won't die. And people have been believing this ever since. Listen, the awful blasphemous teaching of an eternally burning hell is based on the immortality of the soul, the devil's lie. I want to say to my friends who believe in the immortality of the soul, I know that you're comforted with the idea that your loved ones are in heaven. But I challenge you today to recognize that the Bible teaches, Jesus said, that the majority of people are going to be lost. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life, few there be that find it. Broad is the gate that leads to hell. Many therein, many go there. What comfort is there in the idea, if Jesus is true, that the vast majority of our loved ones today are writhing in the pain of an endless hell? You say, no, but they're in heaven. The Bible says the majority will be lost. I can think of no more monstrous idea. People say then, if this doctrine is the devil's lie, for how long will the wicked burn? Well, it's very plain in scripture. Oh, that people might lay aside their preconceived traditions and read the Bible. Would you come over here to Malachi chapter four and verse one, the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi 4 verse 1, surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace, that is hell. All the arrogant and every evil door will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. The Bible teaches that the wicked are going to be totally consumed, and nothing is going to be left. And if nothing is left, my friend, then how can the doctrine of eternal torment be true? Now, the Bible talks, as you know, I quoted the text today, the Bible talks about unquenchable fire. I believe in a hell of unquenchable fire because the Bible teaches it. I believe that the fire is going to burn forever and ever. Because the Bible teaches it. But what does the Bible mean? Would you come over here to Jeremiah 17 and verse 27? Back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, we are a Bible believing church here. Jeremiah 17, verse 27, and the Bible says, But if you do not obey me to keep the Sabbath day holy, by not carrying any load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle what sort of a fire? An unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her palaces and fortresses. Look at me. Jerusalem was burned up with unquenchable fire that could not go out. 
while there was anything there to burn. But when Jerusalem had been burnt up, the fire went out. Unquenchable fire is fire that cannot be put out. While there's anything to burn, it is not fire that has no li limit to its duration. Would you come over now to Matthew 18 and verse 8, where we read about everlasting fire. Matthew 18 and verse 8, my friends. Jesus said, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into what? Eternal fire, my friend. I believe in the eternal fire of the Bible. Come over here to the book of Jude. That's the last book before the book of Revelation, the book of Jude. Turn over here to this text. I want everybody watching on television to get your Bible, please. Look at these texts. Jude, verse 7, only one chapter. It says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and uh, perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of what? Eternal fire, my friend. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, the Bible says, by eternal fire. But they're not burning today. Those cities are beneath the waters of the Dead Sea. Eternal fire is fire that nothing can put out and that burns while anything is left to burn and the consequences are for all eternity. God is not a monster. God is going to cleanse the world of sin and sinners, but the fire is going to go out. People say, what about the rich man and Lazarus? That's what we believe in. Of course you do. Would you come over here to Luke chapter 16, and we're going to read the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Luke chapter 16. And I want you to notice these verses, verse 19 and onwards, my beloved friends. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced. Even if someone rises from the dead. Listen. The Bible, particularly the teachings of Jesus, the Bible is filled with parables. A parable is a story that teaches a central truth, but you cannot push all the details. Every scholar in every church, including the Catholic Church, believes this. Let us interpret this story in two ways, literally and then as a parable. Literally, heaven and hell 
are so close that people in hell can have a running conversation with people in heaven. If this is literally. And the redeemed in heaven, you can look over and you can see your lost loved ones in hell and you can see them screaming and howling in pain. If this story is to be taken literally, now, those who believe in the immortality of the soul should never lose, use this parable, this story, because the people in hell there have got bodies. And they drink water, if they can, and they have tongues. But people who go to hell, according to the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, go there as disembodied spirits. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You must choose one or the other. If you take it as a literal story, it is absurd and ridiculous. But it teaches a great truth. And the truth is this, after death, there's punishment for the wicked. And number two, after death, all the prayers in the world will not change the fate of the wicked. Don't pray for the dead because their fate is sealed, you see. And let us take it as a parable. If you take it as a parable, there is no problem here at all. Because a parable teaches one great central truth. For instance, the story, the parable of the prodigal son is not meant for us to have parties and eat the fatted calf. That is not the point of the story. The point of the story is that the boy comes home and the father is glad to see him, you see. And so this is a parable and it teaches that after death, at the point of death, the fate of the soul is fixed. So that does away with the Catholic idea of prayers for the dead, does it not? Now what does it mean when it talks about burning forever? Would you come over here to Revelation 20 and verse 10? All I appeal to you today is to read the Bible and let the Bible explain itself. That's my appeal. The Bible is its own interpreter. Revelation 20 verse 10. Revelation 20 verse 10. Revelation chapter 20. Come back, yes, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Yes, there is a lake of burning sulfur at the end of the world. Where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. How long was Jonah in the belly of the whale? The Bible says he was there forever. If you turn to the book of Jonah, chapter 2, in verses 5 and 6, it tells us he was there forever. The book of Jonah. Turn over there to that book about the man who went on a submarine journey because he tried to run away from God. Jonah chapter 2 verse 5, the engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, sea seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in for how long? Come on, can't you read the text, my friend? The earth barred me in for how long? Forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Here is a man who says he was in the belly of the beast for three days, but the Bible says he was there forever. Forever is a Hebrew and a Greek time that means that when God says you're going to be there, you're going to be there until he says you're going to come out. The wicked, listen to me carefully. You must see this. The Bible teaches us, number one, there is a hell. I believe in hell. I believe in a hot hell. I believe in the lake of fire. Not now, the end of the world. I believe the fire is going to be so hot that it's going to be unquenchable. Nobody can put it out. I believe it's going to burn forever while well, there's anything there to burn. Then the fire is going to go out. Listen to this. When you go home, get your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 34. I said when you go home. 
Isaiah chapter 34, and it talks about the wicked burning. It talks about the lake of fire. And it talks about the smoke of the, to- of the dam going up forever and ever in Isaiah 34. And I've been there and I've walked around there. I've been there. Isaiah 34 is talking about the destruction of Edom. And the Bible talks about the day of judgment. And it talks about the fire. And it talks about the smoke going up forever and ever. I've been there. And Isaiah chapter 34 is the basis of all the texts in the New Testament that talk about hell. And there's something else you know. It's to find out where hell is. And when you go home, get 2 Peter chapter 3, and it tells you where hell is. 2 Peter chapter 3 tells you where hell is. You know where hell is going to be? It says the earth is going to burn and God is going to cleanse this earth. It says the very elements are going to catch on fire and the people outside of Jesus Christ are going to catch on fire. Now I have some people who come to me, a man came to me when I was visiting a big institution recently and he said, God doesn't destroy anybody. God doesn't destroy anybody. I said to him, try reading the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Try reading about the flood. Try reading about the second coming. God is going to destroy the wicked and cast them into the lake of fire. And the fire is going to go out. Can you imagine that God is going to have billions and billions and billions of people, even in little babies, and they're going to be writhing and screaming and howling for a hundred years, then a thousand years, and a billion years, and there's no end to it, and you say, that's a God of love? If that's true, then God is the devil. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Where hell takes place is the earth, and the earth becomes the home of the saved. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Do you think the meek are going to be walking around and there's cousin Tommy or brother Bill and he's burning away there and you say, boy, I'm having a great time here in heaven? That's what some people think. One preacher said, the torment of the damned will add to the joy of the redeemed. You look over there and you see your uncle, he didn't make it, he was a good man, but he never turned to Christ and there he's screaming and you say, Boy, that's good. It makes me feel good. Millions of people are taught this. Oh, you say, uh, but I don't believe in that. I just believe in the immortality of the soul. That's what I want to believe in. That I go to heaven straight away when I die. What say if you don't? The Bible says most people don't. You find that comforting? Maybe you're a bit of a sadist if you find that company. That's dreadful. The Bible teaches that God has two predominant characteristics. Listen to me. Many characteristics, but two predominant. Number one, holiness. God is a God of justice. The wages of sin, what are they? Death. Jesus on the cross Do you understand this? Jesus on the cross suffered the justice of God. He wasn't just hanging on the cross suffering ordinary pain. Jesus was going through hell. The Bible talks about the second death. Oh, I don't fear, my friend, the first death. I fear the second death. If I wasn't in Christ, that is. Jesus on the cross went through the first death and the second death. He felt the separation of the soul from God and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every person in the world 
outside of Christ is going to have that sort of death one day. That's what hell is all about. You read about it in the Bible. I want you to know that we're dealing with the issues of life and death. The holiness of God. The holiness of God demands justice and judgment. And if you don't let Christ bear your sins, one day you're going to bear them yourself and cry out, oh my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus said, if these things be done in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? The holiness of God. The second great truth is the love of God. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The cross combines the love of God and the justice of God. The cross is the greatest proof that the Bible is true because on the cross, God bears the judgment. God bears damnation himself because he loves us. So justice says there's going to be a hell. But love says it's not going to burn forever. It's going to go out. God's not going to be pulling some supernatural tricks to keep bodies alive for billions of years so he can have fun with them, tormenting them. The love of God teaches mercy, grace, love. Did you know this? That men become and men and women grow like the object of their worship. Is it any wonder that the people who have believed in this monstrous doctrine gave to the world the Spanish Inquisition? They said, we, we do it because God does it. One of the reasons that so many people are harsh on other people, cruel to other people, is because they don't understand the character of God that he's gracious and merciful and loving and kind. See how Jesus dealt with people. Could you imagine Jesus putting someone on the rack? Could you imagine that? If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. The kindest people in the world are the people who understand the love of God. So today, I fully and completely repudiate the devil's damnable doctrine of the eternal torment of the lost. We take the lid off the cauldron, the devil's cauldron, and we want the world to see this evil doctrine and to rejoice in the love of God. And if you've left the church because you couldn't believe in the love of God because you were taught this, Come back to God because he loves you. He did everything he could to save you. Many years ago in Europe, there were a group of gypsies going along with their wagons. And the wagon, one of the, they came to a bridge. There was a flood and the wagon got in the water. And there was this old gypsy lady, big heavy lady with all her robes on. And her son was a strong boy of 18 and he dived in the water to save his mother. And, he, and his mother got terrified and she wrestled him. And he couldn't save his mother. She drowned. And at the funeral for the gypsies, because a lot of them got drowned that day in this flooded river, this gypsy boy of 18, this big, solid boy, looked down at his mother in all her finery and said, Mother, I did everything I could to save you, but you wouldn't let me. I want to tell you something. God's done everything he can to save you. God sent his own son. He didn't just say, I can't do it, you go and do it. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He came down to this world. He lived among us. He went through hell on the cross for our sins. 
He was nailed to the cross. He hardly felt the pain because of the separation of the soul from God. What more can God do? And if you and I one day find ourselves in the lake of fire that wasn't prepared for us but for the devil and his angels, God will look down upon us and in our last moments he'll say to us, I did all that I could to save you, but you wouldn't let me. Two great truths I hold up before you today, the holiness and the justice of God that demanded the cross and the love of God that motivated it.